Okay, good morning everybody, hope you can hear me. Um, I'm surprised they're letting me get up here now that England's jumping out of Europe. But uh, one of the questions is, can we actually get home? Have they put the wall up yet? Um, okay, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, a, an idea that I came up with uh, last year when I was at uh, TAPA ARRL uh, DCC in Chicago. Uh, I was given a talk there on using an Arduino-based uh, system as a CAT controller for uh, HPSCR radios. Um, and uh, I was talking to a few people about my ideas of, could we actually get something running on something like a Raspberry Pi? Uh, so, low-cost processors, and what can we do with them? Um, so, as I said, around, this is October, November, uh, I was doing that, and then by coincidence, I, I had an email from uh, Shell Carlson, LA2NI, who's sitting in the front here, saying, have I tested the Raspberry Pi with my software for Hermes? And at that time, he meant, had I tested the Android code running on a Raspberry Pi? Uh, so, it was quite a coincidence, because I said, actually, I'm thinking of developing uh, a, a specific application to run on the Raspberry Pi uh, rather than an Android version. So, over the last year, there's been many uh, single ball computers released, and in fact, it's now so difficult to keep up with them because almost every day there's a new one being released. Um, uh, typically, they're all quad core ARM processors, uh, and there are ones now available running up to about two. Uh, gigahertz. Um, the low cost and high performance of these have really made it uh, possible to develop uh, a complete software-defined radio on the Android, uh, sorry, on the uh, uh, single board computer. Um, there are many candidates for it. Um, the Raspberry Pi 2 was the one we started with. Um, that was a 900 megahertz, 32-bit uh, uh, quad-core processor. Um, one of the nice things with that is that uh, they actually uh, allowed you to uh, overclock it. So we started trying to run this at one gigahertz. And that actually gave us quite good performance. But just soon after we got all that work in, the Raspberry Pi 3 came out, and that's a 1.2 gigahertz, 64-bit quad-core processor. So we switched to that. And th this actually is a Raspberry Pi 2. I suspect Quite a lot of you have either got them or played with them or seen them. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 looks exactly like the same, and it's such a small uh, package, it's, it's ideal for a small portable radio. Uh, another uh, one that's come out recently is a Pine 64, 64-bit uh, quad-core ARM processor. Uh, you can get it with one or two gigs, and it runs at just over one gigahertz. Uh, I've got a couple of those. I, I have to say I'm a little disappointed in them because I hadn't realized the size of the board. They're about twice the size of a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and th there have been some minor problems with the software on them. Um, Odroid. There's an Odroid C1 plus uh, Odroid C2, which has uh, uh, come out recently that's got 2 gigahertz uh, quad-core processor, 2 gig of RAM. Uh, another ideal candidate for doing some kind of uh, software-defined radio. Um, a very, very recent one is a board called the UP board, and this is actually a 64-bit quad-core Intel processor running at just under 2 gigahertz. Um, I've got one of them. Uh, it's quite power-hungry. That's the only problem. It needs like a 4-amp power supply, um, and it runs quite hot, uh, and not the most ideal thing for a portable radio with a battery. Um, but it's there, and I, uh, I've, I've uh, you know, that's not an exhaustive list. There's lots more available, lots more coming. Uh, the problem is keeping up with them. So, uh, basically what I've decided, let's stick with the Raspberry Pi 3 for the moment, because uh, they're cheap, easily available, and the performance is quite good on them as well. 
So you could take a Raspberry Pi 3 and add uh, a touchscreen to it, and you've actually got quite a nice basis of a standalone uh, system. Now, one of the uh, things we were concerned about when we first started was how much noise we might be getting from the screen. And it's actually amazing how well shielded that screen is and how little noise gets generated. Um, so the Raspberry Pi 3 touchscreen, uh, by default, uh, there's a mounting thing on the back of it for the Raspberry Pi, so you can get quite a nice little uh, compact uh, uh, computer and display. And uh, oh, what, the other thing about the Raspberry Pi 3 is it has built-in Wi-Fi as well, so you're not restricted to running it uh, tethered. And actually, already out on the market, some fairly nice little cases that you can package a Raspberry Pi 3 in. <coughs> um, OK, uh, the software, uh, most of the single board computers run a version of Linux, and many also support uh, Android, and Windows 10 is available on someone. I've never tried Windows 10, uh, not looked at it at all, so can't give you any answers on that. Um, despite the advantages of a touch screen, the mouse and everything, there's still a lot of interest in having a radio with knobs and buttons on it. Well, um, one of the advantages of some of these single board computers is the inclusion of the GPIO pins, and you can connect up to them uh, rotary encoders, push buttons, or whatever you want. So you can actually produce like a front console of a radio with a tune-in knob, volume controls, uh, band changing switches, whatever you want. And uh, there are a number of different rotary encoders out there. Uh, the cheapest one seems to be this KYO40 encoder. It's quite useful. It's 24-bit. It, it's actually quite nice when you're prototyping because it's got uh, pins on it that you can connect wires easily from it to the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's just 24 steps per revolution. It's indented, which means it clicks with each step. So it's not ideal as a tuning control. But as a volume control or whatever, they are quite good. There's nothing wrong with them. And also, they have a, a switch on them. So if you push it, it's like pushing a push-button switch. Quite handy. Um, then, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, there's an encoder that's available on the internet that's 600 uh, steps per revolution. Um, I hate to think how much that thing actually costs to manufacture, uh, but you can get it for about $10. And, and they are so smooth. I think we worked out they've got double uh, bearings in them and everything. Absolutely amazing. I've got several of them now because they're so cheap. Um, the, the, there is one that out on the internet that looks actually quite enticing because it's got a nice handle to tune. And it's designed for CNC machines. It's about 100 steps per revolution. The only problem is it's indented. So it clicks every step. So as you go, like, it's making a horrible noise going round and round. I, I've tried to take one apart to see if you could get rid of the indenting, but I haven't worked out how to do that yet. Um, but what I'm trying to point out is there are lots of these types of controllers that you can buy out there. Uh, quite a lot were. Uh, became available because of the Arduino environment. Uh, and uh, what, what I tried to do with the software that I've written is that you could use any control you want. And especially for tuning, I let you adjust the sensitivity of it in the software. So you can, like, even if you're using 600 steps for revolution, you don't necessarily want each step to move you 100 hertz. Otherwise, the thing's flying around all the time. So you can uh, configure. Uh, a, a resolution of, say, 30 steps for each step in the uh, frequency that you're moving, or whatever. Um, OK, a bit more about the software that I've done. Uh, uh, Warren Pratt, NR0V, who's given a talk uh, in uh, not too long, because <laughs> none of us have got very long on this. Um, uh, Warren wrote WDSP, which is the uh, DSP engine that's now being used in PowerSDR. Um, 
I've taken that and ported it to uh, Linux. Uh, it did take a little bit of work because uh, Warren has specifically written it for the Windows environment, so it is using Windows uh, Thread and Semaphore APIs. So I've had to write a little layer that maps some of that onto uh, the Linux uh, uh, semaphores and threading, and a couple of places I can't quite do that, and I have to go and do an if-def in there. But anyway, I've got that all ported and running on uh, Linux, and in fact, it, it's the same uh, piece of code that I ported and runs on the Android software, which you saw demonstrated earlier here. Um, and WDSP uses the FFTW3 library, and that's already available on the ARM processors. You don't have to download the source and build that. You can just do an install of the uh, uh, FFTW3. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I then set out and I thought, let's, let's write some software specifically for the Raspberry Pi. I'd already got some uh, Android software, which is really written in Java. I've got some other uh, uh, Linux software that I've written before, uh, GHPSDR, GHPSDR3, some of you may be aware of, that allows access over the internet. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted something that took, uh, would run on the Raspberry Pi, made use of the uh, 800 by 480 touchscreen and would work with the touchscreen well. Uh, so it, it's, it's written in C. I use the GTK library for the interface. Uh, the only reason I did that is because uh, I had quite a lot of code already written using that, and it was fairly easy for me to just to take some code from somewhere else and throw it in to get it working. Um, uh, there's a, in the HPSCR environment, we have a, a, a network protocol of how we um, discover and communicate with the HPSCR device. Uh, there is a process going on now where that protocol has been redefined, made more... Uh, Modern, I don't know what the word is, uh, but uh, a better protocol. Uh, so uh, in the software I've written, I actually go out and try to discover if there's an old or a new protocol out there, and it will run with either of the protocols. Um, uh, the code I've written is, is just normal C with GTK interface. It will run and compile on other single board computers. I've got it running on Odroid. I've got it running on the up. I've got it running on uh, uh, Pine64, um, and it actually also compiles and runs on my Intel i5 desktop. Uh, although what I've done on that is I've restricted the display size to be 800 by 480 for the moment, so that I can fully emulate what I'm doing on a Pi, and it, I can do testing a little bit easier on that. A um, bunch of things. Uh, that we've included in it. We've got encoders for tuning. Uh, you can run the whole thing without any knobs and buttons. Um, uh, you, you, everything's available on the touch screen, but if you want to add knobs and buttons, there's an interface to do that. Um, I'm not going to run through these because I can see I'm going to start running out of time. Um, uh, one of the things that I do with the software is that uh, it goes out and discovers all the devices out there and gives you a list of the ones it can see. And then you can select which one you want to start. So in, in my environment, I have about five or six devices on the network. Uh, so I want to see all of them and decide which one I want to use. Um, there's, uh, I, I'm not going to go too much into the user interface, but basically there's a simple uh, configuration thing to start with to say what sample rate you want to run at. Yeah. Um, uh, we have run this at, at 384K, and it does work. Uh, and in, in fact, if anybody was at Dayton, um, uh, Zephyr Labs had their IQ2 there on the stand, and they had a Raspberry Pi next to it running at 384K to demonstrate it. Um, and then there's also some configuration we can do of what, how the screen's displayed, just some options of what you want on the screen. Um, and then once you uh, press the Start button, it pops up, and uh, you've got your standard sort of spectrum display, waterfall display. Uh, 
and then some sliders for adjusting volume and AGC gain and drive and whatever, uh, and some buttons to move up and down bands, up and down band stacks within a band, <laughs> change modes, whatever. Uh, and you, if, if, if you've got all the buttons uh, and encoders on the hardware, then you can configure it to say, I don't want any of that displayed. So you get more space for your waterfall and that. Um, it, uh, when you don't have them displayed, obviously when you want to change the volume, you don't know what it is, so it just pops up a little window to show you where it is, adjusts, and then within about a second after you finish doing it, it disappears. Uh, this is the first prototype that I built. Um, I don't know how well you can see that. It's, uh, it, it's actually a, a piece of double-sided printed circuit board uh, that I sprayed black, <laughs> cut it out. And, and you can just about see in the top loads of wires, so everything's hand-wired across. Yeah? But it works. It was a way to get it up and running and tested. How am I doing for time? About five minutes? Three. <laughs> okay. And this is what it looked like on the back of it. Um, but, you know, it worked. Um, uh, what's interesting, I've, uh, all this is open source. So the software is open source. And in the uh, 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 description on how to get it all set up, it tells you ha what uh, pins everything needs to be connected to. Uh, so anybody could go out and do it. And uh, Jacinto, in, uh, he's in the uh, huh, CU2, is the Aleutian Islands. Yeah. He, he, he actually built one of my original um, Arduino controllers. And then he saw uh, the uh, code appear on the GitHub, and he just went off and did this all on his own. He, he didn't contact me. He didn't ask any questions. He built a system up and, uh, and had it running. And then he sent me this email saying, sorry to bother you. Uh, again, no, because he did ask me one question. Uh, but today I had this serious contact with the US, and it was great. Very good audio report. Best of all, no special adjustments and a simple microphone. So, you know, it works. And, and the nice thing was somebody was able to do all this without a lot of help to get it up and running. Um, well, in the meantime, Shell, LA2NI, had been working away trying to build a complete portable radio. So he, he, he took the Raspberry Pi, uh, a, a Hermes board, and the Apollo board that he's designed, which is the ATU and 15 watt uh, amplifier, to build it all into a single unit. And here it is the ones he's built. <laughs> and it's up and running. It's running on uh, 40 meters at the moment. Of course, we're not getting any signals or anything here. Um, but, you know, what a nice, neat package this is. Oh, you can hear noise if I... Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm go quickly go through this. Uh, uh, here you can see how he's... Uh, what it looks like internally a little bit. Um, and then I've been working with uh, Abby at Apache Labs, who manufacture the Anant radios. And we've, uh, or he, has come up and designed a printed circuit board to replace a lot of the cabling that I was doing and mounting the uh, rotary encoders on the board. And here's an example of that with the Raspberry Pi 3 on the back. And I think, uh, I still don't know exactly what he's going to do, but uh, you may be able to buy the board without the display and without the Raspberry Pi as one option. And I think you may be able to buy a complete package with it in a uh, case as well. Uh, it's still undecided if he's going to package it with a Hermes or another board as well, but hopefully we can do that. Okay, future development, uh, ongoing improvement and bug fixing. Um, Codec 2 uh, Digital Voice actually is already there now. I've got that all. So it's just another mode. You step through the modes. You've got single sideband, uh, lower sideband, upper sideband, 3DV as an option. 
uh, all built into it. Um, looking at support for pure signal, and uh, also I'm looking at trying to do some support for the Lime SDR, uh, which I've got one available now. Um, and some problems with uh, not having USB 3, but it can run on USB 2 at some lower sampling rates. So. Anyway, I'm going to say, well, thanks to Shell for doing all this work, putting that together. Also to Abby for producing this and to Warren for giving me a DSP engine that I didn't have to do a lot of work with. <laughs> so are there any questions? Thank you.